Hello and welcome to International Women's Month. I'm really excited today to have Laura Jackson in the hot seat. And Laura is an amazingly inspiring founder who started her life in the North, came and discovered London. And we're going to go on that journey with her from just grafting all her life to founder, CCO of Glassette, the fantastic um, homeware company, and along the way, many inspiring and fun TV shows. Welcome, Laura. I'm going to go straight in with something which is literally we had at the end of our pre-talk, mm -hmm. um, because you are sitting here beautifully pregnant. <laughs> and when we had our pre-talk, only at the very end, mm -hmm. did you mention to me you're seven months pregnant? Yes. And um, and I kind of want to start with that sense of you are an incredibly busy businesswoman and wear all these different hats, and yet you kept the pregnancy a bit quiet. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't even spoken about it, so it feels strange to, um, I don't know, like externalize my thoughts on my pregnancy, because I have, really haven't spoken to anyone about it. I have just felt like I haven't been able to tell people, and this is my third pregnancy. That, you see, that's what's so surprising as a businesswoman, if it was your first and you'd had this conversation, I would presume mm. it must be your first. Mm -hmm. What do you think lies behind that? I don't know if it's kind of, I feel like the word shame feels quite heavy, but I do think that there is a stigma attached to a pregnant woman. They're not capable, um, they're more tired, which is actually quite true. <laughs> um, but I just, I just think people think about you differently and I really wish that wasn't the case. But I know that there's an element in truth. I mean, let's just go back and we'll touch on this later because mm. I really think it's interesting for women who are thinking about motherhood or who have gone through motherhood. And, and I think we can all identify with that sense of what identity do you present. Mm -hmm. But much earlier in your life, when you were in your sort of 20s, did you have a clear sense of what you wanted to do? Yes and no. I kind of knew what I didn't want to do. I knew that having a desk with a picture of my family on it where I went every single day and had a lunch break and there was a photocopying machine mm -hmm. was never the right path for me. Why did you think of that as vision of something? Had members of your family been in that job, you know? I don't know. And also it's just, it was a strange picture in my mind of what I didn't want. Mm -hmm. I think because I, I feel like, um, in a way I'm quite unemployable because I, like to do lots of different things. I'm very creative. I'm kind of a bit of a daydreamer. And I think that's why I've kind of always worked for myself because mm -hmm. I think I've probably not been able to work for other people. Were you the but... kind of person at school that your careers advisor, and my careers advisor said to me, you might make an okay secretary. Did somebody else give you an alternative picture of what you could achieve? Um, I have to say school was not a great place for me. I don't think that they ever thought I was going to really amount to much. I, um, wasn't very studious. I wasn't very academic. I've got dyslexia and it just wasn't a place where I thrived unless it was arranging parties or going to the fish and chip van at lunchtime. I kind of, all my reports are Laura uses school as a place to socialize, which I did. And um, I just was never very good at school. I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't like the lessons. I didn't feel very understood. And being dyslexic in a class of 30 people, you're not really a priority. Yeah. So it just wasn't a place where I felt that I belonged. And it wasn't until I moved to London that things really changed for me. And what made you move to London? Did you leave school and then think, I'm going to London? Good Northern girl, I'm going to London. <laughs> I'm going to that London. Yeah. Um, it was, it's such a, this is a really random thing, but my, uh, through a family situation, we ended up moving from Huddersfield, which is where I lived my mm. whole life, to Leeds. And I never wanted to move to Leeds. Um, but we ended up moving to Leeds and um, I ended up staying in Leeds and going to the university there to study events management. And as I was studying, I was watching Ready Steady Cook mm -hmm. and there was this amazing guy called Johnny Roxburgh on there and he was an event planner. I know Johnny, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, what? There's an event, there's a job as an event planner and he was talking about going to Marrakesh and buying candles and doing all of these amazing things. And I was like, I, I want to do that. So I had the opportunity to do a placement year within my course that was my second year. And I was like, right, I want to work for this party company that finds candles in Morocco. 
and get out of Leeds. And that's what I did. I applied for a placement there. And I think they At thought... At Johnny Rocks was company. Yes. And they accepted you. Did you have an interview first? Um, I had lots of interviews. I yeah. think they thought I was absolutely barking mad. I think they just thought I was a bit hilarious. <laughs> they took a punt on me. And I'm so grateful that they did. And that's when everything changed for me. And I, I, I always quote this song lyric and it sounds ridiculous, but it's from the song um, by the band James. And it says, if I hadn't seen such riches, I could live with being poor. And I came to London and I was like, what is this place? Yeah. It is amazing. Yeah. Everyone is just really wacky. And there isn't that kind of linear thought that not that Northern people have, but at school, it, they always said to me, or oh, you could be a nurse or a receptionist. It was a place where dreams were made. You could be any anyone you wanted to be. You could meet interesting people. And I was having such a great time doing this placement like handing out canapes at these parties. I yeah. absolutely loved it. I had the time of my How life. How did you finance yourself? Because I can't imagine Johnny Roxburgh paid you a huge salary. <laughs> you come from the north. Did your family help you out? Because that very early stage for a lot of people, mm. going to a big city is really tough. Mm. And finances can be tough. Yeah. So what did you do? Well, it wasn't today, which is a lot more expensive. Yeah. Um, and Johnny, they paid me. I think I got about... I must have got between twelve and fifteen thousand mm. pounds, and um, and I managed on that. And what I did was um, uh, I I worked in the evenings for them doing um, waitressing shifts. So mm -hmm. in the day I worked in the offices doing various roles, whatever needed doing, and then in the evening I waitress. So I could finance myself. I lived in a, a house share with some random people that I met online, um, and uh, wasn't really spending lots of money because I was working. So yeah, yeah. I managed to just do it myself really so opportunism started at an early age of not looking glass half full mm -hmm. i feel about you laura there's yep. that sense of where's the opportunity yeah you know and my parents are so supportive i've you know my mum my stepdad and my dad they're always you know they've always said you can do anything that you want to do they've mm -hmm. always instilled this confidence mm -hmm. in me that i suppose not that i didn't get from school but i think having really supportive parents that were like of course you can go down to london and do that why yeah. couldn't you work for that company yeah. you know rather than if i think if i'd thought about it applying to this very well to do events management company that did all of these events somewhere at the palace and it was like beyond yeah. like anything I'd ever seen before. I think if I'd really stopped and someone had said, oh, do you really think that you could do that? But my parents never said that. They were just like, go for it, love. So, so you move from Johnny Rock, so you become a receptionist at Shoreditch, or yeah. were you doing that as a night job? So I was at, um, so I did my um, year um, at the events company, and then I moved my course down to Greenwich because I was just having such a good time in that London, didn't want to yeah. go back home. So I finished my course at Greenwich University, and I was still working for the Admiral Crichton. Then I really wanted to go um, travelling, and I was like, right, well, how do I make money to go to South America. I needed to have a night job where I wasn't going out with anyone, mm -hmm. like even spending any money. So I had I got a job um, at the reception at Shoreditch House because I, I still couldn't believe, oh my God, the job's out there where you get paid to talk to people. Like, this is brilliant. Um, so I was working on the reception, then got this job doing TV presenting. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it happened like that. It absolutely did. And it was yeah. such a like, I, but I've always loved telly. Mm -hmm. And I think it wasn't until I moved to London that I realized that people had jobs in telly. You it's just, mad. So what do you think? You watched the telly before and you thought that's not a job. What do you mean by that? I don't know. I just... I, you didn't think something so fun could be a job? No, I just, I didn't, I didn't... Um, even at school, when we talk about careers advisors, I, I still now, I think I thought the only food job was being a chef. I didn't know people wrote recipes or took pictures for magazines. <laughs> okay. of food. But was telly for you just like somebody then came up and then was it that kind of flow? Or were you like, I now want to do this kind of shit and I now want to do this kind of shit. How did it go for you? As I said, I watched a lot of tele. I still watch a lot of television. Yeah. I love television. I love the way that it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. And I love storytelling and I love the ability to move people and tell other people's stories and be mm -hmm. part of that it's so meaningful to me mm -hmm. I cry at so many television programs it's ridiculous I can't yeah. even watch to the end of Long Lost Family otherwise I'm just a mess and I, I think I've always wanted to be that narrator that storyteller and 
even though I was doing shows that were, you know, Take Me Out, for instance, Stand By Your Man, Celebrity Super Spa, I was telling people stories in a way that was kind of really fun and accessible and relatable. And yeah. I really loved being a part of that. Yeah. But I think as I've kind of had my children and, and grown up and got this business, I've got a more defined uh, broadcast head of where I want to be mm-hmm. and the stories that I want to tell. Yeah. And I feel really actually quite confident about that now more confident than I've ever felt about it before because I think looking back I was like oh wow this is really exciting they really want me to do this job and more than what would I like to do and how do I think it will help what else I'm doing exactly it is more it's more thoughtful in Mm. that approach I was on Instagram the other day scrolling Mm. and I saw this quote no but seriously normalize finding love in your 40s normalize discovering and chasing new dreams in your 30s normalize finding yourself and your purpose in your 50s life doesn't end at 25 let's stop acting like it does what made you write it i think there's just so much pressure mainly on women to achieve certain things by a certain age and it sometimes is quite overwhelming Mm. and i think the pressures like forbes 30 under 30 Mm -hmm. it's just really annoying and did you want to be in forbes 30 under 30 no i don't know why i've even quoted that i think it's more just the pressures of 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 age that we that we feel and I I felt it when I was younger and I feel it now and I know I'm going to feel it when I'm older and I think we're just all how do you define older Laura gosh when I'm like when I've got grandkids I think that would be older for me I mean you could have grandkids at 50 yeah that's very true so am I I are you sitting next to older no I'm sitting next to wiser oh god sucker upper (laughs) I'll just say though (laughs) it's true (laughs) I don't know what, this is the thing, it's like, I don't know. But did you, you didn't feel at 25, so you wrote that, but did you feel at 25 your life was over? Because I feel by what you've spoken about, you felt like everything's in front of me. No, I didn't feel like that at all. I didn't even care about being 25. I don't think, my main pressure actually was probably personal pressure um, and more pressure to have a family. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to have a family over the pressure of what, where my career is going, which is interesting. Yeah, I think, think so. Yeah. This is a, maybe this is a, a bad analogy, but when people, when I talk to people about television shows and we talk about what time that's going to be on or is it going to be daytime or what channel or what platform, mm. I'm like, I want to make a great show. Mm. I want to make a great show. So for me, in a way, age doesn't mean anything. It's about what you're doing and is it purposeful? Mm-hmm. Does it have intent mm-hmm. and integrity? And I think that that, transcends age personally but obviously yeah. having children that potentially doesn't isn't the case let's go to glossette mm-hmm. because you have embarked on this journey during lockdown yeah so that's now how many years ago two years ago it's been two years it's been since two years idea yeah so what took you from this really enjoyable telly career thinking I want to have something that when I sleep at night it's a business that's still going as opposed to mm. only when I'm awake is my career moving forward? Yeah. Gosh, it is, as you know, having a business is really a journey without yeah. sounding like I'm on X Factor. It is a lot. Mm-hmm. It's effort, it, and, and it means so much to me, and I'm so passionate about it, just like you are, that it seeps into everything, mm-hmm. every thought, every moment. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about glassware or... Yeah. Um, who we're going to speak to in terms of investors because we're raising money at the moment. What should go in the investment deck? You know, it, it's just it, it's just in every cell within my body. Did you think it would be like that? I think I, yes. And I really, I, I love a challenge and mm. a thriving chaos. And I like to be busy and I like to be, I'm, I, as I said, like I'm not very well educated as it were. Like I didn't do very well at school. So I don't, I don't really have that, academic brain but with this it's been like doing an MBA or something the last two years and I've really enjoyed it because I'm doing something for myself and my family my brother-in-law is the CEO he's married to my sister and it very much feels like it's the fabric of our 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 little family um so how much of Sunday lunches with the family are about business oh gosh which we're trying not to make it about business but you know, I it's can't funny. go to a restaurant with him. I'll be like, "Oh, this is a nice glass. Oh, where's it from? Let me take a picture yeah. of it. Let me just Google it." And then it's like, "Whoa, slow down." Um, but yeah, it's been quite the challenge, and I found 
some things really enjoyable and other things really difficult. So what? give me some examples. HR is difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, HR in terms of just building a team. Building a team, yeah. understanding different people's needs, mm-hmm. um, different people's boundaries, different people's expectations, because it's your business and you can live, eat and breathe it, but that's not... Or should it be the expectation for the people How that work How late at night will you call anyone who works with you? Oh, I, I think... <laughs> Just tell me. Yeah. Tell me. Not after five. No, no. No, tell me, honestly. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one as a as a founder, CEO, COO, CEO mm. of a business, that when you're sparking ideas, mm. you know, it's like I had to put on my email, and I don't know if it's still on as a message at the bottom... If you get to certain time, it doesn't mean you have to answer it. You yeah. can answer without. I mean, I don't know if that's... Is that still on my email? I need to check. It is still on my email. But when, mm. it's, when it's in my brain, I'm scared I'll lose the thoughts. So I have to email somebody on it. Because if I put it in notes, I might forget I wrote a note on it. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I think um, now we have launched the business, things... I mean, I'd love to say things have settled down. They haven't because now we're going yeah. out to raise money. And it's Dan and I talking all hours during the night. Yeah. He's in the office really late. They, he doesn't have children yet, so... There's a Henry Ford quote, which is something like, if you think things are really, really under control, you're not moving fast enough. Oh, that is just so true. I, I, the, the thought... Uh, I don't mind moving backwards. Yeah. I hate standing still. I'm not into that. I, I, if, at least if I'm moving backwards, I know I've got to move forwards. Or, That's an interesting way to look at things. Actually. Yeah. yeah. I don't like when everything's like okay mm-hmm. and chilled and don't have to worry about anything. I'm yeah. like, what is going on? Then I'll, I'm mean, probably just, as my husband said, just create some sort of chaos just for the fun of it. But um, I, I like and I thrive when fi- there's lots going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got an amazing team at Glasset and we have been really lucky. Um, but things like accountancy and tech and building a tech team and looking at logistics and distribution, all of that sort of stuff. We have, you know, we're building a really great team that can help Dan and I with that, but we're also still so early on in our business where we do want to have oversight of everything that's Mm -hmm. going on because... How many are you in the business now? So there's 10 of us that are full time. And then we've got a team of five who are helping rebuild the tech for us. Before we moved to this office and I knew what everyone at that time was looking at on their mm. laptop. There's something I miss about that, Laura, yeah. because when you build businesses, at some stage you have to delegate and let go of certain things. And if things aren't exactly as you envisage them, there's that sense of enabling the growth of your team versus feeling is the imprint of what they really need to know there enough yeah. to enable them. It's a, for me, that's one of the biggest dilemmas mm-hmm. it, as we grow the business. Yeah. yeah. And I think that because so much is in my head in terms of how I want things to look and how I want things to sound and how I want them to resonate with other yeah. people and how we grow our community, that's really important to me. Let's talk about your me. community. So how, what, what is your community to you? How did it start? Instagram has always been such a lovely place for me. Um, you know, start nestling oh, into yourself when you say it. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I, but I just, I feel like I have a really great... <laughs> yeah. Uh, community can mean lots of different things to lots what does of it different mean to you? people. I think it's just having a bit of a tribe. Yeah. Having a tribe yeah. who support and empower each other. Um, and Instagram has always been a really nice place for me. I've always, you know, I can put on like, oh, I'm looking for this. Has anyone seen this cushion? And someone will get back to me. Or yeah. I'm thinking about going on holiday to Spain. Anyone got any recommendations? And I, I kind of use it as a bit of a little... Like a nice book. Yes, because it's where it feels like a very trusting, nurturing space mm. where we can share ideas and, and talk to yep. people. And um, yeah, it's always that's always been really important to me. And I think that my audience is kind of like it's a small audience but they've kind of grown with me as I've got older and as things have changed and progressed and you know the ebb and flow of life and and I think that it's been really important when I started Glassette that we had a really strong community and that pillar Mm -hmm. is one of the strongest pillars within our business and I think that loyalty and trust within a business is it means so much Mm. so leading off on that then what does international women's month mean to you i feel like international women's day still needs to exist we're still nowhere near there with equality Mm. which is what it's all about i think even things like personally not being able to share my pregnancy with lots of people um equal pay equal opportunity Mm. rights we are absolutely no we're near there which is why we need to have days like this to 
highlight these issues. I mean, I feel like there's a bit of a epidemic going on at the moment in terms of women's safety. Mm. I got, you know, after I saw you at the um, at an award ceremony, I got followed by this guy on the way home and it was absolutely awful. And normally I'd turn around and be like, Boy, you, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. But I, I, felt I, vulnerable. I felt so vulnerable mm. and I don't know if it was because I was pregnant or I really did feel threatened. I'd never felt threatened in that capacity before. What did what, you do? Um, I went back to the station, called my sister and she came to get me. And she was like, please don't walk home. I can't believe you're going to walk home. I'm like, it's nine o'clock. Why is it that we feel so unsafe? Why can't we just walk home? Yeah. And especially at winter, it just feels like our day's over at 4 p.m. when it gets dark. Um, and I put it on Instagram and so many people, like the outpour was absolutely mm. insane. Some mm. abs- Just some really awful stories. And it happens all the time. And I don't think we're anywhere near getting it sorted. No. I mean, it's a bigger picture, that issue. Yeah, that, that is an issue that I think any woman listening will at some stage have felt. Yeah. You know? And I think when you're pregnant, you feel even more because you have this responsibility for something inside you. So when I was pregnant with Lila, you know, I did work and work and work. And I just, it was like I pretended I wasn't pregnant two weeks before I did Parkinson, two weeks after I did Graham Norton, you know, and then I went to America and did a TV show for three months whilst I was breastfeeding Lila. I felt I was... I couldn't afford to take the time off Mm. and that I was in a flow of my career that if I stopped, it would go away. There's an interesting thing. I think we put pressure on ourselves of what our expectation is. So at the very beginning, when you spoke about, you know, I can't tell people because there's an element of what we think people would judge us for, which can then feed into us then thinking, let's not. And I think a part of our progression is to, you know, just own what we are Mm. so I'm a career woman who is pregnant and like I'm a career woman who's pregnant and like let's get on with it you are right though in a way I do think I should own it and I don't know why I feel scared to own it I don't know I don't know what's holding me back I mean you did mention today you're happy to tell strangers being on the tube like hello (laughs) I've got a bum I need a seat get up move out the way way. um but yeah I think um I, yeah, I probably just need to own it. But I love my job. Mm. I love my job. I love working in television. I love the opportunity to meet such a breadth of really interesting people. And, you know, I've got this kind of north-south of me going on. Like, I love everyone from the north. I'm very northern in lots of ways. But then I love living in London and floating around in a nice sushi dress, (laughs) asking people to, you know, give me their seat on the tube. So... Yeah, I just, I really like my job and I think I wouldn't want someone to say, oh, I don't know if she's ready to go back to work yet because she's mm-hmm. just had a baby. I don't know if anyone would say that. Maybe they wouldn't. But I just... It's your company though, so it's different. That's different. But in terms of like telly or any mm-hmm. of the brands or any of the other stuff that I do that I really love, I think I just like adding my creativity to anything that I do and I wouldn't want anything to to hold me back. I don't think anything will hold you back, Laura. (laughs) Can I just say, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. And I just want to thank everyone for watching. And let's give it up for the joyful Laura Jackson. We just have to clock. Everyone will ask, because otherwise there'll be tons of comments. Where are the earrings from? Um, The earrings are um, Simone H&M. Oh, Simone H&M. Very good. Yes. Um, The... Dress? Uh, Hoffman, um, Copenhagen. Yeah, Scandi brand. Yeah. The shoes? Um, Carell, Paris. Lovely. Trusty M&S tights and um, Cos. Cos, Cos for everything, basic. Um, 